themselves. So no matter who you are, no matter where you grew up, no matter how you grew up, no matter how much money you have or don't have, no matter how much education you have or don't have, the reality is, is that every single one of us right now, as you hear this, is on a journey of faith. And everyone's faith journey is different, right? Everyone has a different set of variables in their faith journey. I remember for me, my faith journey really got rolling when I was in college. I remember when I was a freshman in college. So uh, this was a long time ago now. You know, uh, I had a bunch of friends who were, um, were spiritual, quote unquote. And it became like, you know, you know how it goes when someone, one of your friends in your group gets spiritual, then everyone's super spiritual, you know? Because it's like the me monster. It's like, well, you're spiritual. I'm even more spiritual than you, you know? You have this whole thing that goes on. And so everyone was spiritual. And so kind of being the personality that I have and, and the way that I was raised, I'm like, well, okay, all you guys are spiritual. I'm absolutely anti-spiritual. That's what I used to say to my friends. They'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, we're spiritual. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not. Well, you know, and I was kind of against it because I thought it was like kind of hokey that everyone was being spiritual. And, but what, what happened when I started doing that was I remember in my heart and in my mind, I started thinking to myself, I said, you know, I don't even know anything about spirituality at all. Because I grew up in, in, in a really uh, a loving family, but very, you know, a kind of devoid of any talk about God or anything like that. And so I remember like having these thoughts and I remember I was taking a philosophy class and I was taking a religion class at college all at the same time. And I'm anti-spiritual, you know, and uh, so I'm super confused and I'm hearing all this stuff. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I wonder if there is a God. Like, it was a strange thought for a 19-year-old mind. Like, I wonder, like, is, there, is God real? Is, is God just, you know, a human conception that we just kind of come up with to figure out how we're going to navigate this life that we're living in and all the things that go on that we can't control? And I'm having, you know, I got a philosophy professor, and he's saying one set of things, and I have a religions of the Western world professor who was actually a PhD and a pastor, but he didn't even really believe in Jesus. Like, I think his whole class was to get us not to believe in Jesus, which was ironic because I didn't believe in Jesus anyway. He made me start thinking more about Jesus because of his not wanting me to believe in Jesus, which is strange. But that began a journey, and what's beautiful is that journey in my life still continues today. My faith journey is not finished. My faith journey is in process. Because I'm here today and our lives are a building upon what happened yesterday. You're, like who you are as a person is not finished. You are building upon all these decisions and life experiences that you've had. And every single day is a new day to build afresh on whatever it is that your life is. And that's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about life. There's an old saying. How many of you have heard the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? How many of you... Believe that to be absolutely false. Raise your hand. Everyone raise your hand right now. Put your hands up. Everyone, both hands. Now give me your wallets. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Sorry. I'm just kidding. Don't give me your wallets. Listen, if you're alive, today's the day to learn and grow. All right? But I want to share something with you today that no matter what your faith journey is, and even if you don't, believe what I'm going to tell you in a moment, I want to tell you that what I'm going to tell you is the absolute truest thing about your faith journey. That literally, what I'm going to say, and in a moment I'm going to say it, it's going to go up on the screen so you know this is the thing. No matter where you are today, this is the absolutely truest thing about you and your journey, and that's this, that you and I, we live upward by loving God. We live upward by loving God. See, it's all about this upward, inward, and outward, right? Upward is God, inward is yourself, and then outward is into the world. Now, here's the thing. Your faith journey has very little to do with outward initially, and it doesn't have a lot to do with inward. Your faith journey has to do with God, right? So there's no such thing as a spirituality, or a faith journey that does not include God in it. Because if you think about what something spiritual is, the spirit is eternal. 
God is spirit. The spirit of God is, is when eternality touches down into temporality. What is eternal or immortal touches down into what is mortal or temporary. By definition. And so the truest thing about you is that you were created to live upward by loving God. Now, where do I get this from? Of course, I get it from Jesus. This, the theme of this series, Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 38, which is a quotation of Deuteronomy 6, 5, where they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and Mark's gospel says, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. I call this living upward, right? Because the key to life is about God and you. And everything about your life is actually lived out from this upward relationship. God's love for you, that you return to God, and then everything else, how you feel about yourself and how you feel about everybody and everything around you is actually driven by God. Your beliefs about who God is or who God isn't. Your beliefs about what God is interested in. Or if you say, well, I don't believe there's a God, that is gonna drive the way that you view yourself and the way that you view other people. If you believe that God is angry, that's gonna view the way you see yourself and the way you see other people. If you see God as loving, then you're gonna view yourself and other people that way. If you think that there is no God and all that exists is the survival of the fittest, that's gonna change the way you view yourself and the way you view other people. See, the upward access... The upward dimension of life is gonna drive everything about the way you value yourself and the way you value other people, the way you treat yourself and the way you treat other people. And that's why I think the greatest battleground in the day and age we live is who is God? Now, if you've been around Crossroads a lot, we, in talking about things, oftentimes we'll talk about Jesus instead of the generic word for God. And the reason we do that is because I meet people every day who say, well, I don't believe in God. Or they say, I do believe in God. And I always ask the same question, which God do you not believe in or do you believe in? Because statistically, almost 90% of the globe believes in God. But the question is, who's the God that you believe in or who's the God that you don't believe in? Like, I love it when I meet someone who's, uh, who would con consider themselves an atheist. There's probably some of you right now who are here and it's like, yeah, that's me. I always say when someone says, well, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, which means ah in the Latin or in the Greek, it's a negative prefix. So ah means no, and then theist means God, because theos is the Greek word for God. So someone who is uh, an agnostic, a means no, gnosis means knowledge, means I have no knowledge of what it is, so I'm not saying there's no God, but I don't really know, right? Apathetic, anybody know, anyone been known apatheas? Yeah. Ah means no, pathos means passion. So someone who's apathetic is someone who's passionless, right? We can do this all day, right? So you got that, you can impress your friends, you know, you know the word ah, the prefix? It means no. And so when I meet someone who's an atheist, they say, well, I don't believe in God. I say, well, which God don't you believe in? Well, I don't believe that God is angry at everybody and wants to smite everybody and send everyone to hell. I'm like, yeah, I don't believe in that God either. And I'm like, and I'm a Christian. So we don't believe in the same God. And that really messes people up when you start doing that stuff with them. Because <laughs> they don't know what to do with that. You're like, I don't believe in that God either. Let me, let me tell you about the God who I do believe in. Right? And I start to explain to them. I believe in the God who sent Jesus on a rescue mission to redeem all of us who are messed up. And you're messed up? Yes, I'm messed up too. Yeah, we're all messed up. That's why we need Jesus. And they're like, well, I don't believe in Jesus. Now, I'm like, now we're getting somewhere. Now, why don't you believe in Jesus? And they say, well, I don't believe that he was really a historical figure. I'm like, well, his, you know, actually history is not on your side. <laughs> you know, and he says, listen, you start explaining, like, you know, what would make you believe in Jesus? I mean, is like eyewitness accounts good enough for you? You know, it's not good enough for you. Well, it's good enough for the court of law. So, you know, and, and, you, could, and you could start to unpack all these things with people. But everybody has a belief about God. And whatever someone's belief about God is drives who you are and how you see yourself and how you treat other people. So when Jesus, they asked him what the greatest thing is, he said, look, you need to love the Lord your God with all that you are. And I want to unpack that today. Because to me, everybody is living upward. And everything that everyone does in regards to upward living is going to impact every other part of their life. And for me, I always say that we live upward by loving God. 
Because Jesus, who we are following, if you are here today and you would say, I'm a Christian, that means that you follow Jesus. Right? Like, you, you, you don't just check Jesus in the, in the survey box of your, uh, of your census paperwork every 10 years or whatever. Jesus is the person who are literally saying, I am following that guy. Right? And Jesus said that the most important thing is that you and I, that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so I call this living upward, and we do it by loving God. But how do we do this? So I want you to open up in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4. I'm going to be taking verses 7 to 21. So I literally want you to open up your Bibles. Grab, if you brought your Bible with you to church, praise God. I, I would give you uh, uh, some kudos, but I ate all of those. Um, <laughs> So good. But I want you to open your Bible because I'm going to be reading a, a number of passages here and I want you to be able to read along. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible with you to church, I don't want you to worry about it because we supply Bibles for you. They're right there on the seats in front of you. You can pull those things out and you can just open it up there. First John's pretty easy to find. Of course, if you have a smart device, um, because they're smart, they can find First John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21 for you if you just type it in. So I want you to open that up. If you're new to the Bible, 1 John is towards the very end of your Bible. If you, the last book in your Bible is the book of Revelation. Then before that, you have a, one, a couple one-chapter books. You have the book of Jude, and then 3 John, 2 John, and then guess what happens? 3, 2, and then 1 John. There you go. So it's right towards the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to read you this whole passage, and then I'm going to break it apart for you. Look what it says. 1 John 4, picking up in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, I don't know about you, that's a powerful section of Scripture. And there's a lot in this section. What I want to do is I want to pull out some ideas out of this long text. And I mean, really, if we were going to give this text the proper treatment, it would probably take me a whole sermon series just to do these 13 verses to really tease out all the unique dynamics. So I just want to give you some, some big ideas. Now, first, what you need to know here is that when it comes to loving God or living upward, that God started it. Like the relationship that you get to have with God, God initiated, God started. I always think of my kids. I love my kids, Obadiah and, and Maranatha and Annabelle. Whenever there's like a little uh, ruckus going on, which is always, you know, it's always like when you're, when you're stopping some fray in your home, it's like, well, he started it or she started it. Anybody, you guys know what I'm talking about? The blame game? 
It, it started back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve and the serpent. Everyone's blaming each other, you know, for what's going on. Now, if you want to know about your relationship with God, God started it, right? The blame is all the Lord's. And I put that, I said that with my tongue firmly implanted in my cheek. See, God started the relationship that you get to have with him. How do I know? I got all these verses here. Look at what it says here in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, verse 10. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And if that's not enough, go right down to verse 19. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Now I want you to grab your pen. I want you to circle verse 19 in your neighbor's Bible. Go ahead. Grab your pen, circle it. Underline it. For those of you who are looking for a good tattoo idea, tattoo that verse on you. Even better than tattooing it with ink on your arm, let the Spirit of God give you a heart tattoo. That you love God because God first loved you. Now, this is mind-blowing to me. Because what this says is that us, our ability to live upward, God is initiating and sustaining that because not only did, do we love God because he first loved us, but we get to continue to love God. Why? Because God continually loves us. And if you doubt that in any way, remember what I read to you, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us. Now think about that. This is saying that God's love has been manifested or revealed towards us. How is God's love manifested and revealed? That God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So what this means is that real life, truly spiritual life, whatever your faith journey is, you are designed to walk in the manifestation of God's love, his own son, and then we live through Christ every single day. So what happens is when you or I are to put our faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, takes up residence in our lives, and then the Spirit of God lets us move through this world in Christ, not on our own. Where God, not only does he say, hey God, I'm gonna give you the wheel of my car. God's like, I'm gonna give you a whole new car. And my Spirit's gonna be the chauffeur. And you don't even have to decide your destination because I know where I'm taking you. See, the Christian life is not, I live my life and I hope that Jesus is involved. The truly biblical Christian life is that we live and move and have our being in Christ and our lives are found there. In verse 10, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, what this means is that God not only initiated and preempted this relationship, but God is the one who sustains it every single day by the presence of his Holy Spirit. And again, in these verses, verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us what? His Spirit. Oh. What I love about the Lord is that God doesn't ask us to do anything that he does not intend to make sure that we can accomplish. See, God's not like a teacher who says to you, listen, you're gonna take an exam, good luck. Doesn't tell you what's on it, doesn't tell you what he wants, just says, man, listen, I'm gonna give you some questions and hopefully you're gonna get the right answer. No, God says, look, what I want is I want you to love me with the totality of who you are. In every circumstances, in every single situation, that's what I want from you. And he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send my son Jesus. He's going to die on a cross to forgive you of your sins. And when you say yes to him, I'm going to place my Holy Spirit within you. And guess what? Jesus and the Spirit are, are going to be the ones who broker my love to you. And all I want you to do is respond to it. Just respond to it. Do you ever have those days when you're kind of in a grumpy mood? No, you guys never do because you're good Christian people. All the rest of us... Right? It's like you have these moments where you're kind of grumpy. But you ever notice when you're kind of grumpy and someone isn't grumpy? Right? Now, in the, in the beginning, and we're going to be honest here because we do this here at Crossroads. We like to be real about this. When you're in a bad mood and someone's in a good mood, first you want to slap them in the head. 
That's the first thing you want to do, right? Like you're kind of like, will you stop smiling right now, right? But it, anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, everybody, good, right? But what happens is, is if that person is continually still not letting your bad moment become their bad moment, at some point, your moment lightens up, doesn't it? Yeah. It's powerful that that happens, isn't it? See, and what that means, if you, if you take that simple kind of crude, not really crude, but realistic example of, of our lives, and, and you relate it to your relationship with God, there are times when you and I are fickle in our love for God. Like, God is loving on you all the time. Never stops. Never is like, yeah, you know, I'm kind of tired of them right now. It's like, he's always loving on you. And sometimes we're kind of like, uh, you know, I don't really know about this whole thing right now. Or, Lord, I know I should, you know, love you right now. But I really don't right now. You know, you have all these things that go on. But God is so consistent in his love, isn't he? Like, like the Lord is never, like, giving up on that. And what happens is, is that if you simply stop rebelling against it or pushing against that love, but you allow God's love to now begin to mediate your own feelings. Now all of a sudden you realize that you are in the ultimate situation of love. See, when we start talking about loving relationships, of course, for many of us, we've gotten radically hurt by people. Like all we know is loving relationships that are not faithful, that are not abiding, that are not self-sacrificial, that are selfish. See, every human relationship that you have is broken in some way, even in the best situations. You might have a, a spouse who you're like, man, they are a saint, but they really ain't because they need Jesus, and Jesus makes them a saint, you know? You could have the most patient, kind dad, but he still needs to get saved, right? And so what happens is, is that on the, ver on, the, on the horizontal level, every relationship is a little bit messed up, but there's this one relationship, that vertical, that upward relationship where God's love never fails. It never gives up. It's always and forever abiding. And that's why this upward relationship changes everything because God never backs off on his love for us. What's amazing, and this is what it says in Jeremiah 31 verse three, it says, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Now, that word everlasting, do you know what everlasting means? Everlasting. I, you, guys are, you guys are good. It's like you guys get language, how it works. Like everlasting means it lasts forever. It's before you got here, and long after you're gone, God's love for you remains the same. Like, think about that. I was born on December 31st, 1975. Now, at school, I'm a twin, so my parents got a double tax deduction last day of the year. They were praising God for that. But then they went into the mayhem of having two little kids who were crying and needing diaper change and all this stuff. But, but anyway, long before December 31st, 1975, God's love for me was exactly the same. And whatever the last day of my life is, whenever that day I take my last breath here on earth, you can fast forward into infinity and guess what? God's love is exactly the same for me. And what's super cool? So same for you. Long before you got here, long after you're gone, God's love lasts forever. And not only that, it says, notice, therefore with Loving kindness I have drawn you. See, right now, God is drawing each one of us on this journey of faith. He's saying his love is drawing you. He's saying, come on, come on. Take the next step with me. Take the next step with me. Take the next step with me. It's okay. I got you. I'm drawing you. And what's going on for many of us right now, many of us who are hearing this, is that your fears because you've gotten hurt in this situation and this situation and this situation and this relationship, it didn't really live up to its expectations and this and that. And all of a sudden, God's inviting you by his love. And we're saying, you know, I'm not really so sure about this right now. What if God withholds his love? And I'm here to tell you, he won't. Now, that doesn't mean that God's always going to do what you want him to do. And I think that's an important, we, like, I got to put that out there. Because there's some of you right now who you're upset with God because God didn't do what you wanted him to do. 
But think about this for a second. If God is God, right, then God is perfect. He's all-knowing. His love is everlasting. And his plans and purposes are higher and greater than ours. So don't you think we should want what God wants, not what we want? Now, don't get me wrong. I realize in some situations, you're like, well, how could God let that happen? Or how could God think this is the best thing? This is the worst thing. And I've had that thought many, many times. But my next thought is, well, he's God. And every single day I'm learning how much I don't understand. So maybe I should just trust him and learn how to die to myself. And that's part of the journey. See, as you walk with the Lord and as you experience God in all these different ways, and as you realize how amazing he is, you start to realize, like, you know what, I can actually trust God because God's pretty amazing. And he's faithful and he's trustworthy. And God loves with an everlasting love, and he's drawing me with his loving kindness. So maybe what's going on in my life right now is actually God's way of drawing me closer. Maybe when God does things I don't understand, it's because he wants me to seek him because I'm really designed and created to abide in him. And if I always understand what's going on, I might not seek him in the same way. Like maybe God has a purpose and a plan for exactly what's going on in your life right now. And I say that maybe he does knowing that he does. But sometimes we have to speak the good news of Jesus to ourselves and not just listen to ourselves. So God started this. Now, from there, what I want to tell you is this, is that love leads to more love. So this love that God initiated and is sustaining, it leads to more love. You want me, want me to show you how it happens? Look at verse 7, 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For he who does not love does not know God, for God is what? Love. You go down to verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And then you go down to verse 21. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Now, you see now why upward, that us responding to God's love with love is so important because this love, this upward vertical access, right, that love leads to love in every other area of our lives. That's why I can say confidently that someone's views of God and opinions about God's and feelings about God, right, their faith journey is going to dictate how they feel about themselves and how they feel about others. Because whatever it is upward, you end up getting it inward and outward. And that's why, like, in the book Upward, Inward, and Outward, there's four different sections in the upward where I talk about how do we cultivate upward living. And what's powerful is I get all those things right out of the Bible. These four things, if you were to understand them biblically and you were to practice them and, and, and walk in them every single day, you will find every single day that your upward relationship, you returning God's love back to him, it will grow every single day. Because I believe that as we grow deeper or higher in our relationship with God, that's going to deepen and transform the way we see ourselves and the way we see the world around us. And if the art of living is loving, as we learned in our last message, now what we realize is God's love leads to more love in these lives. And remember I told you that the difference between a good life and an extraordinary life is a lot of love. Now one of the things I love about God's love is that because I am not always the easiest person to love, but God still loves me, it frees me up to love people who are uneasy to love just the way God has loved me. Now, isn't that the problem that we have? How many of you guys find it hard to love people? So about a third of you raised your hand, all of you should have. 
Because, well, you know, I had a great experience yesterday. It was such a great reminder. So, so I was actually traveling from, you know, we had service on Wednesday night. I left early Thursday morning. I was in Southern California. And then I got back home last night about 9 o'clock in the evening. And, and we get on this plane. That been, I'd been preaching every single day for like a week straight. And, and we get on the plane. And uh, right as we get on the plane, we're about to take off. And it's super hot on the plane. Now, I realize I was in San Diego, so... You know, having been up here, I'm like, man, I'm dying anyway from the sun, you know. And, and, and so, and we get on the plane, all of a sudden the guy comes on the loudspeaker and he says, you know, this has never happened before, but, you know, one of the maintenance guys was, was doing his final run through and his hat and his glasses got sucked up into the air conditioning unit of the plane. <laughs> now, my first thought was, what? <laughs> you know, and then my next thought was, oh, no. You know what I mean? It's like I've been, I'm tired. Anybody ever been frustrated or unloving on a plane before? Yeah. Now everyone's hand goes up. How many of you have find yourself being unloving? Nobody. How many of you ever struggle on a plane? <laughs> you know, that's how it goes. And I remember just being like, oh, no. You know, and, and, and the flight attendants start, you know, kind of walking through the cabin. And I'm tired and it's hot. You know what I mean? And like when you have like, 10 pounds of dreadlocks. It's like three times as hot for me. And I'm like, I'm going to go in the, in, the, in the bathroom and cut them off. And like, I'm just like, I'm, I'm having issues. But, you know, and then, and then the, the flight attendants are just trying to make everyone happy. But I'll be honest, I'm feeling a little surly. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of want to have like the, you know, like, you know, like when you're kind of feeling surly and you want to have the conversation, it's not going to change the fact that the maintenance guy's hat and glasses are in the, the AC unit. Because I'm like, I, what kind of person puts their hat in the AC unit? Like, as if that conversation has any fruitful value in that moment. But I'm, I'm feeling all these ways, you know? And, and so, but, you know, but I'm like, you know, but it's not going to change anything. I'm just, these poor flight attendants, like everyone on this plane is mad right now. So I'm going to try and be nice to them. You know, and so I'm like, oh, thank you so much for the water. Da, da, da. You're having a good day. And, you know, and, and I'm just, you know, and, and I'm like, I'm faking it till I make it. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm not feeling it, but, I'm, but I'm, I know what I'm supposed to do. And sure enough, about halfway through the flight, I, you know, I, I go to the back to, 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 to stop in the restroom. And, and, and one of the flight attendants say, say, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Are you the pastor of Crossroads? <laughs> and I'm like... I am. And she's like, I thought it was you. I've been watching your videos on, on Facebook, you know. And, and, and in one of our flight attendants, you know, she always posts your video. And so, do, do you know who she is? And she doesn't picture it. I totally know who it is. You know what I mean? And she's like, you know, I figured you were because you're so nice. <laughs> oh, listen. Praise God. This was not me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, but it was like in that moment... Because all these things are going wrong and I'm tired, I got to get home and I want to make sure I get a good night's sleep so I'm not like a, like a total hot mess for you guys here not knowing what I'm going to talk about, you know. And, and, so I, and, and so, but God, because his love is so great and because I know that God's love changes the way I look at other people. It's not just about me being hot and me being cranky and me being tired, but I see these flight attendants who are trying to serve all these people who are hot and cranky. They may or not, may or not be may or may not be tired, but now I'm like, I just want to try and bless them because they're trying to bless other people. And then all of a sudden I realized, man, if I would have been a jerk, what kind of testimony is that? But here's the thing. The people around you know that you follow Jesus too. They might not see your videos on Facebook, but they know that you are a follower of Jesus. And what I love about this is God's love leads to more love all around us. So listen, God wants you to be a vehicle for more love, his love to enter into the world. And that always happens through tough situations and bad situations, situations that you didn't choose or didn't want. Those are the situations where God's love reveals itself in the world the most profound. Because what was amazing is, is a number of the people on that flight were very, very angry about what was going on. And you get to be an example of God's love in the world. So God's love leads to more love in your life. Of course, John chapter 15, verses 12 and 13 says this. This is my commandment, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. 
So this ability to live in love upward, God started it, and God's love now leads to more love. We're going to unpack that. Unpack it in the book. We'll unpack it over the next couple of messages. But to close this message out, you need to realize that we cultivate upward living through investment. Through an investment. See, love grows through an intentional giving of yourself to see fruit born. That's what investing is. Investing, whether you're talking about investing your money, like maybe you have like a retirement plan or something, or, or any, an investment is any time you give of yourself to something to see it grow or be cultivated. And I'm here to tell you, and, and you realize this, you're here today at Crossroads because you're saying, I want to make it an investment in my spiritual life. Right? But to grow living and loving upward, it's something that you need to keep feeding every single day. Look at what it says here in 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So the simple investment that I want you to make today is I want you to love God by loving the people around you. Because that's the investment. He's saying, look, how can you say you love God if you don't love the people around you? How can you say, I have this great relationship with God. God loves me, I love God. If you're not willing to love the people who are right there at street level, who you can touch and who you can feel, who you can see. And I think that might be the most important investment any of us could make. I, this happens all the time when I pray. I say, God, I want to love you more. I pray that a lot. And God, and God will respond to me, well, I want you to love your wife. I want you to love your kids. I want you to love your neighbors. I want you to love the people that you're struggling to love because I loved you even though you were lost. I loved you even though I didn't agree with what you were doing. And what's amazing is that if you and I begin to live outward with God's love, God receives the glory, and that's cultivating actually that upward relationship. I believe that the human capacity for love is an untapped resource that is so needed in the world today. I believe that God wants to enlarge our hearts so wide to experience his love and return it to him that we can't help but love other people. And you can love someone and not agree with them. You can love somebody and completely detest how they're living. And real love is not divorced from truth. I mean, isn't that what it says in Ephesians? That we should speak the truth in love? I've said it a million times, quoting um, Warren Wearsby, the great commentator, that love without truth is hypocrisy, and truth without love is brutality. The church is really well known for truth without love, isn't it? We have the truth of Jesus, but if someone doesn't agree with us, we don't love them. And that's brutality. That's not love. I just saying, well, I'm going to love everyone. I'm just going to let everyone do whatever they want. Real love cares enough to be able to say, hey, I love you, and I'm not perfect, but what you're doing, I'm worried about. I don't agree with. But it's an investment that you and I need to make every single day. It reminds me, of course, of Paul's great prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 and 19. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. What this means is that the amount of love that God has for you, we can pursue it and invest in it our entire lives and it still surpasses our knowledge to be able to comprehend it in its totality. 
And I love that. God's saying, look, I want you all every single day as you're on this faith journey, every single day that you're building upon your life, I want you to invest in loving other people because when you love other people, you are loving me. And guess what? No matter how much you love, you will never be able to fully comprehend the totality of my love this side of eternity. So what this thing is, God has put all of us on the greatest adventure. Every day to say, God, I want to know more of your love. A little bit more of your love. Lord, enlarge my ability to understand a little bit more of your love. And you'll never, ever get to the end of that rainbow. You're never going to be saying, I've experienced all of God's love that he has for me. It's not possible. And that's why it's so powerful. Because you were designed to receive and give love. And God's saying, I want to put you on a journey. That every single day it's going to grow. And it's going to grow. And it's going to grow. And it's going to grow if you're willing. And my friends, that's what Jesus has for you. That today can be a day of experiencing more of his love than yesterday. That this week more than last week. That this year more than last year. That this century more than last century. So my prayer for us as a family of faith is that we live upward by loving God. We just, every day we say, Lord, today is a day to live upward. Every circumstance, you're like, Lord, this is an opportunity to love upward. And if you're already a follower of Jesus, there's a part of you when I say this, you're like, that's what I want. Right? That, that's where it's at. So let's invest in that. And let's pursue that together. But I believe that there are some of you here right now, you haven't said yes to Jesus yet. And I want to read to you from 1 John, verse 4, a few verses here. John says this, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in God, and God abides in him, and God's love abides in him. So if you've yet to say yes to Jesus before, whether you're in our Southwest Portland campus or you're part of our internet campus, if you're here in our Vancouver campus, this experience of upward living, returning to God, His love, it starts and ends and it, that relationship grows by confessing Jesus as the Son of God, believing in Jesus, allowing Jesus and His death on the cross and His resurrection to do its perfect work. The only way that you can become a child of God is not because you're alive, but because you've been remade, born again in Christ. And God wants that for you. And in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes and begin that journey. And if you say yes to Jesus, you will grow and understand this love and be able to return it to God unlike anything you ever even dreamed was possible. So let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together.